Thanks, Scott, uh, for the introduction. Uh, next, we are going to proceed to the first section of the conference. Uh, welcome our first speaker, Shen Jie from the City University of Hong Kong on the paper, Hiring High Skill Labor Through Mergers and Acquisitions. Shen Jie, please. Okay. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, so this is joint work with Jun Chen from Ruming University of China and Feng Zhang from the University of Utah. So as you can see from the title of this paper, our primary research question is whether mergers and acquisitions can be driven by skilled labor demand. Uh, so we think this is an interesting question uh, because the answer has strategic implications in using mergers and acquisitions to overcome labor market frictions or shortages in the labor market for high-skilled workers. And so this slide attempts to highlight some of those labor market frictions encountered by firms pursuing traditional hiring strategies, such as direct recruitment. For example, direct recruitment can be fairly costly if the labor market has severe information asymmetry in which the employers may have to uh, exert tremendous amount of effort and time to validate and verify the quality of the workers. Um, second, direct recruitment may not be all that feasible. Uh, the reason is because the labor market could be extremely tight. Uh, this could be confounded and made worse if some employers engage in anti-competitive behavior, such as forcing their workers to uh, accept non-compete clauses in their employment contracts, which prevents workers from working for their competitors if they choose to leave the company. And lastly, direct recruitment typically doesn't allow the hiring of entire teams of workers. So what we do in this paper is we try to uh, talk about aqua hiring or talent acquisition through M&As as a possible solution to overcome many of the shortcomings of traditional hiring strategies. In fact, aqua hiring has been quite prevalent and common among tech companies anecdotally. So this is a recent uh, acquisition or an acquisition by Facebook around 2012, in which Facebook acquired a startup company named Spool specifically for five employees. So if you read the last sentence of the last paragraph of this slide, you see that Facebook had no interest in the firm's technology, their service, or their user data. So in fact, their assets were not of particular interest to them. This action is actually quite consistent with what Mark Zuckerberg stated a few years ago, prior to 2012, that Facebook did not once buy a company for the company itself. They buy companies to get excellent people. And as you know, Mark Zuckerberg is the CEO and founder of Facebook. And this view is quite uh, common and shared among tech executives and founders, including Evan Spiegel from Snap, the founder and CEO of Snap, who also expressed similarly that typically if you buy a business, it comes with really talented team. And for them, at least, the team is usually everything. All right, so what we contribute to the M&A literature is systematic evidence on aqua hiring, which has been traditionally di very difficult to do uh, for several reasons. First, aqua hire targets tend to be very small. And this is problematic because transact small transactions tend to be the details of small transactions tend to be unavailable or unobservable. Second, it's very difficult to distinguish aqua hiring from other types of acquisitions because we don't observe the transfer of assets or talents from the, acquire, from the target to the acquirer. And lastly, even if we could observe the transfer of talents from the target to acquire, we don't know if these acquisitions are actually motivated by skilled labor demand. So we provide here in our paper causal evidence that skilled labor shortages induces acquisitions, and particularly acquisitions involving targets that have hired skilled workers in the past. We do this using two natural experiments involving the H-1B work visa program in the United States. So this program is ideal for two reasons. First, the program itself is designed for employers looking to hire high-skilled foreign workers that are very difficult to replace with local labor in the US. These workers tend to work in the STEM fields. And second, the program itself provides exogenous variation in labor supply at the firm level, either through random allotment of visas at the firm level, 
or through exogenous policy changes. So we can visualize these two settings using the following graph. So in this graph, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the total number of available uh, visa, work visas available each year. So there's two things you should notice from this graph. The first is actually the first, uh, the discontinuity uh, around 2003 and 2004. So the overall supply was actually unexpectedly reduced from 195,000 to around 60 to 65,000 in 2004. So we're going to exploit this sudden drop in a difference in difference framework to compare M&A activity before and after 2004 between firms that uh, hired H-1B workers prior to 2004 and companies that have never hired H-1B workers at all. So the idea here is that firms that depend on H-1B workers will be exposed to a shortage around this time period. The second thing you should notice from this graph is the highlighted blue bars. So the, these the light blue bars. So these light blue bars indicate years in which the entire supply of H-1B work visas was rationed by lottery. So this only occurs if the entire, sorry, the aggregate demand for H-1B workers exceeds the aggregate supply within the first week in which H-1B applications were made available. So I'll come back to these settings again in, in greater detail in the subsequent slide so that we're on the same page. Okay, so our main data set comes from various sources, um, but the key independent variables within our natural experiments come from two data sources. The first is the labor condition applications data that we obtain from the US Department of Labor. This data provides us a measure of total demand for H-1B visas for, for, at the firm level. The second main, the second key data set that we use is the processed I-129 petitions, which we obtain from the USCIS or the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. This data provides us a measure of supply of H-1B visas allotted to firms. The other data sets are quite standard. We have SDC that gives us M&A transaction details, patents view for patents data, and CRISP CompuStat gives us financials and accounting data. All right, so this is summary stats, so I'll skip this for the sake of time. Um, so to reiterate again, our first natural experiment is going to exploit H-1B visa lotteries. These lotteries take place only in this case in which total aggregate demand exceeds aggregate supply. Take fiscal uh, within the first week in which applications are open. So take fiscal year 2009, we have petitions or applications accept started to be accepted starting on April 1st, but within the first week, USCIS received over 150,000 petitions. Because 150,000 exceeds the 85,000, the entire supply of work visas was therefore rationed by lottery. So in fact, these, this type of rationing or lotteries took place six times within our data set for 2008, 2009, and from 2014 to 2017. So we focus on these years within our empirical specification. Okay, so our, our uh, exogenous variation of labor supply at the firm level comes from, more precisely, the win rate, okay? So the win rate is defined as the ratio between the total H-1B uh, visas allotted to the firm divided by the total number of H-1B visas demanded within a fiscal year. So we predict that a lower win rate or lower fraction of demand met for H-1B workers will lead to more acquisitions. All right, so before moving on, I want to kind of reiterate that we are not saying that acqui hiring is the only option uh, to pursue in response to skilled labor shortages. Uh, of course, these firms can pursue traditional hiring strategies simultaneously, such as hiring skilled foreign workers from the labor market directly. They could hire local workers. They can poach workers from the competitors if they want to. They can even temporarily relocate workers that fail to get H-1B visas to foreign branches and bring them back in later. That's all fine. Alternatively, they can abandon projects or even outsource the R&D, but the last two options are not ideal. We are simply trying to make a case that uh, when these other options are prohibitively expensive or infeasible, firms may pursue ACO hiring as a superior choice to recover lost labor or labor shortages. All right, so some stats, which I'll skip for the sake of time. Um, so up to this point, um, I've only asked you to accept our win rate 
as exogenous or random. But of course, we can go one step further to show that indeed our win rate is going to be uh, uncorrelated with key, determin key determinants of MA uh, activity by regressing the win rate on several firm characteristics that you know uh, may may uh, that may influence a firm's decision to pursue acquisitions, such as firm size, firm leverage performance as proxied by return on assets, Tobin's Q for firm value, cash holdings, and employee, employee count. And based on this table, it should be clear that none of these coefficients per, are statistically significant. So this slide is our key finding for our lottery setting. Uh, so our, our outcome variable for columns one and three are the total number of acquisitions and the total number of acquisitions involving targets that have hired H-1B visas or workers in the past, okay? Columns two and four are dummy variables corresponding to number of acquisitions, if the number of acquisitions exceeds zero, and also if the number of acquisitions involving targets uh, hiring H-1B workers in the past is also greater than zero. The key independent variable of interest is the fraction of demand met for H-1B workers or the win rate, and the point estimates of interest are circled in red. And based on the coefficients, we see that they are all statistically significant and negative, which suggests that the, a lower win rate will lead to more MA activity. So our point estimates or magnitudes are actually quite, are not trivial. So we find that a one standard deviation decreased in the likelihood of winning H-1B lottery will lead to 7% more acquisitions, 8% more acquisitions involving targets with H-1B work visas and an extensive margin of 1.5 percentage points. These numbers are very similar to our findings in our second natural experiment in which we exploit a, uh, the H-1B the quota cut. So just to summarize again, for the H-1B quota cut, we're estimating a difference in differences model. We're comparing M&A activity before and after 2004 and between firms that are dependent on H-1B workers to those firms that have never hired H-1B workers prior to 2004. And we find that the treated firms or the firms that are exposed to a labor shortage will experience 12% more acquisitions and 25 more acquisitions involving targets that have hired H-1B workers previously. Okay, so this slide again is our summary, is our summary of our main results for our difference in differences setting. The outcome variables are, are the same as before, but our key independent variable now is an interaction term between a treatment dummy and a post year 2004 dummy. So treatment again is equal to one if a firm has hired H-1B workers prior to 2004 and therefore exposed to a labor shortage as a result as it, from the cut in the H-1B visa quota. The point estimates of interest again circled in red and we find that the coefficients for the most part are statistically significant and positive indicating that firms that are exposed to the labor shortage will pursue further acquisitions. Okay, so uh, obviously using the difference in differences framework involves lots of assumptions. And the main assumption that we rely on is the parallel trends assumption. We can't obviously test for it formally, but we can visually inspect it by estimating a dynamic version of our previous model and interacting the treatment dummy with individual year dummies. Uh, the coefficient, uh, the, the pre-outcome variable trends are circled in red, and we see that the coefficients are not statistically different from zero, which again suggests that the parallel trends assumption, at least in visually inspecting it, is not violated. And our last robustness check for this setting, uh, it's possible that our uh, setup is maybe capturing something that's unrelated to the, to the quota cut, and maybe just something correlated or specific to hiring H-1B workers. So we're, we conduct the follow, following falsification test. We pretend there is an H-1B H quota cut in 2014. And so our key independent variable of interest is an interaction between a treatment dummy that's now defined as equal to one if a firm has hired H-1B workers prior to 2014. And we find that the treatment effect under this placebo test is not statistically significant. Okay, suggesting that our main specification is not most likely not producing false positives. Okay, so hopefully up to this point, we are fairly convinced that skilled labor shortages, shortages induces acquisitions. So you may still be skeptical, however, that our acquisitions may not involve uh, hiring, right? Hiring of workers. So what we do is we try to rule out alternative um, hypotheses by 
refine by conducting further robustness checks. So we'll just we're, what we do is we refine our outcome variables to be more precise so that it captures the labor uh, component and also conduct uh, cross-sectional analyses. And we, we try to uh, tease out a stronger treatment effect for firms that have fewer hiring options, right? So for, for refining our outcome variables, we find that acquisitions tend to be concentrated among targets that have hired H-1B workers, uh, targets that have hired H-1B workers with similar job functions as the acquiring firm, targets that operate in the high-tech industry, and targets with undisclosed transaction sizes. So targets with undisclosed transaction sizes typically mean that their asset size is, is negligible or small relative to the acquiring company. Again, suggesting that our results is not being driven by asset acquisition. We also find more acquisitions regardless if the target has patents and regardless if the, if the target operates in the same or different industry as the acquiring firm. Again, suggesting that our results most likely is not being driven by IP acquisition or uh, market power, okay? And lastly, we find that acquisitions tend to be concentrated among firm uh, among uh, those that are headquartered in states with stronger enforceability of non-compete laws. Non-compete laws raises the cost of hiring workers because it's harder to poach them, and so firms behave more, more will more likely rely on acquiring to uh, to uh, acquire talents. Uh, with regards to cross-sectional analysis, we find that the treatment effect tends to be stronger among acquirers that have more experience. The argument is that these experienced acquirers tend to be better at retaining acquired talents. We also find that the treatment effect tends to be stronger among firms with lower foreign operations. So firms without uh, the ability to move workers around to, you know, so that they can bring them back later will rely on acquiring. In a separate test, we also find that skilled labor, short skilled labor shortages will lead to more uh, employee stock option grants. Uh, again, the idea here is that acquiring does take place. There are talents being transferred and the firm is actually incentivizing using long-term incentives to retain the talent that they acquired. So overall, we find that our robustness checks suggest that indeed acquis late talent acquisition is, is, is most likely being taking place. Okay, so after establishing this relationship between uh, skilled labor shortages and acquisitions and aqua hiring. Uh, the next natural question obviously should be, does aqua hiring produce synergies? So this question is actually very difficult to answer and is actually quite controversial now because some, some scholars have suggested that uh, labor synergies don't actually materialize because many of these workers tend to exit or leave the acquiring firm shortly after being aqua hired. Um, this is, a, of course, indeed a very challenging question, and it's because we don't observe the counterfactual in which the acquiring firm uh, completed deals actually uh, are, are withdrawn, right? We don't observe that. Um, but we do our best to, to um, shed some light on this question by following the methodologies uh, available in the literature. So the two papers that we follow are Ben and Lee, 2014, and Seru, 2014, who essentially estimate a matching difference in differences model by starting out with a set of completed uh, transactions, completed deals, and matching them with exogenously withdrawn deals uh, according to some criteria. So we follow the same criteria, but at the same time, we ensure the following. We make sure that the treated and matched control deals, uh, the acquirers of the two deals have the same four digit NAICS industry, or in other words, they operate in the same industry. The targets, the same thing also operate in the same industry. And we also ensure that the announcement of the, the completed deal and the match deal, match withdrawn deal uh, are announced relatively close to each other. And if there are multiple matches, we kind of, we kind of, uh, we only keep the deal in which uh, that have the closest relative transaction size. All right. And uh, lastly, in order to comment on labor synergies, we, also require that both the acquirer and the target firm have, hi have hired H-1B workers previously so that we can compute a labor function similarity source. So this is a cosine similarity uh, calculation based on the job categories or job codes that we, that, we, uh, that we have from our data sets. All right, so this is our main results for 
uh, the matched matching difference in differences model. We measure labor synergies or firm performance based on two outcome variables, ROA and ROE. And the key independent variables here are, is an interaction term between treatment and post. Treatment equals one for completed acquisitions and post equals one for uh, years after the acquisition. The, the, as you can see from the coefficients highlighted in red, labor synergies do seem to be uh, positive and statistically significant on average. But what's more interesting is that these synergies seem to materialize or concentrate on deals in which there is high labor similarity. Or in other words, there's high uh, transferability of skill and labor between the acquirer and the target. And lastly, in this slide in columns five and six, you see that synergies don't seem to materialize if there is absolutely no relevance between skill or job functions between the target and the acquirer. Okay, so uh, this is a set of related studies to our paper. Um, so I guess for the sake of time, I'll just uh, skip over this um, and I'll just conclude briefly. So our main, our, the, the main message of our paper is twofold. First, we show that skilled labor shortages will lead to more acquisitions, particularly more acquisitions involving targets that have hired high-skilled workers in the past. And second, we find that labor synergies do materialize, particularly for transactions and deals in which there's high labor or skill transferability between the target and the acquirer. Okay, so thanks again for uh, inviting uh, our paper onto the program and we look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Shenjie, for the uh, sharing of the paper, which is uh, very interesting. Um, next, let's welcome the discussant for the paper, uh, Vincenti from the London School of Economics and ECGI. Vincenti, please. Many, many thanks for the opportunity to discuss uh, this paper, a uh, very interesting paper. Um, let me summarize the paper, uh, although I think the author has done a really good, has done a really good job. Um, so the objective of the paper is to analyze whether merger activity can be driven by the desire to hire workers, in particular skilled workers, or in other words, to establish an empirical link of acquihiring to the acquisition of scarce skills, right? Uh, and, you know, on top of that, the paper explores many, uh, several other aspects, including the performance implications of acquihiring. The approach or the, 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 the source of variation of the paper is, first of all, the merger activity across firm-specific outcomes on these H1B visa lotteries that I will call experiment one, uh, but also across aggregate shocks to the H1B visa lottery or in particular changes in the legislation. Um, and also to study the performance of complete, completed versus uh, withdrawn deals. The results of the paper, and the paper has quite a lot of results, is that first of all, major activity is higher when firms have more visas rejected. Major activity is also higher uh, after visa demand, you know, after H1B visa demand uh, kind of is, 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 is um, supplies or is shorter. Um, the paper also kind of shows an assortative matching of worker skills affected by this shortage of H1B visas and mergers. And the results are also consistent across intangible capital intensity patents in particular. Um, the paper shows that there are additional stock options granted after acquisitions and also that the acquires of completed deals outperform acquires of withdrawn deals. Okay, so in general, I found the paper very interesting. Uh, I think acquihiring has been around for a while as a concept, but there are still not that many careful papers, empirical papers that explore it. Um, I think the source of variation and its interactions is, is, is very rich. You know, these H1B visas are genuinely random and, and potentially I mean, surely linked to the idea of skills, uh, regulatory changes, measuring pay, patents. Uh, and I'm going to have three main comments about the paper. One, I think the H1B variation is trickier to use than, than the paper portrays. Um, I also think that the scope of the paper could be broader or it's a bit narrow to think in terms of pure human capital. And finally, I will talk about you know, the complication of, of assessing performance or, or assessing performance in the way the paper is actually uh, doing it. So let me start with my comments. The first experiment measures what is the fraction of visa applications that are rejected for a given firm, right? And this is a regression analysis that includes year uh, and also uh, firm fixed effects, right? And the idea is that when a firm has a lot of H-1B uh, visas rejected, there is a need for skills, right? 
The thing is that this is a bit of a tricky contest because who can be unlucky in this contest? Which are those firms that actually have a low fraction of their H-1B visa applications uh, accepted? Well, definitely not the big firms. This is just a binom binomial distribution of a firm that requests 200 H-1B visas. And you can see, you know, this is the 50-50 chance of getting the visa, which is common in many of the years, that this is a fairly narrow, you know, 20 kind of people interval, okay? So it's fairly safe for a, for a large firm to kind of understand what is the fraction of workers that you're going to get, uh, you know, from, from this uh, visa request, absent ag aggregate kind of uncertainty, which in a way the paper is uh, kind of neutralizing with year fixed effects. So this is not something that is identifying the results, okay? Uh, the picture is very different for a small firm. So this is a firm that has only 10 uh, visa requests. And here, the distribution is much flatter. The variance, is, the variance of the binomial distribution grows at the rate square root of, of n, but the, you know, the, the scale of this graph is growing at the scale n. So this becomes a much flatter distribution. And here, a small firm is actually can be much more unlucky. Um, and it, the, the uncertainty is actually maximal when the probability of success is 50%. As you move to, to lower or higher probability of successes, actually uncertainty is lower, which is actually seen in, in the axis rather than in the height of the graph because I made them all equally sized, okay? So is this relevant for the sample? Well, here I point, I've pictured the graph for the median firm, which has five, sorry, visa applications. And here for the mean firm of the sample, which has 57 visa applications. And you can see that for many firms, in the sample is either one or the other situation, right? A lot, of, a lot of uncertainty and not much uncertainty is something that you can actually overcome, okay? Now, why is this relevant? Well, big firms are rarely unlucky in this context, while small firms can both be lucky or unlucky, right? So in a way, the treatment group of the paper are the small and lucky firms, while the control group of the paper are the small lucky firms and the large firms, right? And, and on top of that, given the structure I was showing before, um, sorry, this structure I, I was going before, on, on particularly, you know, on an average year, on a particularly good year, on a particularly bad year, this, uh, this kind of imbalance gets changed, right? Um, so, because small and large firms are going to be differentially affected by aggregate conditions, right? Uh, so, because the problem is not monotonic. Now, fixed effects will not help here, right? Because fixed effects are going to capture the aggregate effect. The aggregate effect is the same for all firms. It's going to be this fact that you know you are using as control group, you know, different a different set of firms that are the treatment group. Even if the sense of the bias is difficult to sign, it's clear to me that small firms are overweight in the regressions. Most of the results of this paper come from the smaller firms. And this is not something that the paper takes care about. And again, size dummies or firm fixed effects will not help here because this is some time varying effect that you cannot control for in that in that fashion. Okay. Related, relatedly, uh, firms can undo some of the visa tightness by over demanding workers. If I expect that I will get less workers than I need, I will probably ask for more visas. And firms can intertemporally compensate for H1B visa tightness, but this is more relevant for large firms. You know, this is a very complicated problem for small firms. Firms that need to demand three, four workers uh, uh, visas per year, it's complicated. For a large firm, this seems to me like a trivial problem. Right? Okay, you know, there's some uncertainty, but you know, in the long run, I can really have the number of workers that I want, and I know they are skilled, so they, they are not completely interchangeable, but I can kind of manage around with this problem. Second comment. Um, something that crossed my mind is that in the management literature, the idea of firm capabilities has been around for a while, and we are not using it much in finance, and I think it's very relevant uh, to this paper. Okay, so the idea of firm capabilities is that firms have multiple characteristics that work together. This could be the human capital, of course, but it will work together with the assets of the procedures, right? So a typical example is a very efficient plant of, of say Toyota, which is renowned for being the most efficient company manufacturing cars in the world. And there are the machines and the people and the procedures and the corporate culture, everything works together in ways that, uh, that actually make it very efficient. And the thing is that you cannot imitate Toyota by buying the same machines or by, by hiring the same workers or by imposing the same procedures because it's all an equilibrium, right? You have to do everything at the same time, okay? The interaction is key, right? And it's also important because then capabilities are going to be very hard to buy unless you buy the whole plant. 
Uh, and also you don't need to bargain with your capabilities unlike human capital. So, you know, a very good worker that brings all the added value by, by itself is going to be willing to bargain and to get a higher wage. But a capability, which is a joint thing that compounds many, many different things, is not going to try to bargain with yourself to extract that, that surplus. So from the perspective of BA, I, I, I thought that focusing on human capital, and this is not just the problem of this paper, seems too restrictive, right? And seeing intangible capital like the patents and human capital as substitutes, uh, to me, is also restrictive. I would, I would quite think that the big part of the M&A uh, business or the M&A market is about buying capabilities. It's about buying the whole package, right? Uh, so I think that the, the patent results, and, and I think the information that the authors have could help us understand capabilities beyond just human capital in the context of, of M&A. And I don't think the paper yet tries to approach it. You know, the presentation talked a little bit about teams, but it, I think it's, it's even broader than that. It has to do with other things. Comment number three on the performance part of the paper. Um, so the strategy that the paper follows to measure performance is first of all, find the sample of exogenously failed mergers, then match it to a group of mergers with high kind of human capital cost and similarity by industry and roughly period, the three year window, and then compare performance. Now, these failed mergers are not matched to the actual mergers by anything other than industry and a three-year window. Uh, it's very coarse. And, and also, you know, why don't we use returns? I mean, why should we focus on, on ROI and ROE? I mean, returns have much better properties in this context, right? To me, this seems to be like a very cumbersome or expensive way to have year and industry fixed effects. These, these mergers, which are fairly average, these failed mergers, they, they have fairly standard return on asset and return on equity. They are not doing much to the estimation. So, uh, you know, to me, that kind of drives the attention away from the actual thing, which most of the action is on the actual mergers. I think this is just some kind of uh, way to, to kind of include some year and sector fixed effect that we could do in much better ways. A couple of words of cautions. Return on equity is affected by leverage and mergers tend to change leverage. And return on assets is affected by things like the step up and the goodwill created in M&As. Uh, and again, these are things that uh, we know we have to take care of when we look at mergers. So they are particularly not great measures to look uh, to use for performance when, uh, once we focus on mergers, nor is by the way Tobin's cube because it changes both the numerator and denominator in, in different ways. Other comments, the paper uses opti option grants and has an interesting results uh, in it. But I thought that option grants were quite negligible these days. I think it's all about performance investing stock. So it's somehow, you know, probably they are correlated with the real thing, but they are not the real thing. So, so why can't we look at something that is more, more relevant? Um, and also in terms of assortative matching, the paper says that the very states that firms with more H1B visas tend to acquire firms with more H1B visas. And it's kind of hints that it's because they need them. But it could be many things. Could be that they have similar technology. Could be that they operate in similar regions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So summing up, I think the paper covers a very important topic. Uh, it has lots of empirical, relevant empirical evidence. Uh, I think the strict focus uh, on workers has pros and cons. In a way, it has a, a narrow scope of the paper, but it may not be the most interesting question to ask. I think the broader question about uh, capabilities and, and what is relevant to M&A, uh, I think, is more interesting. I think the empirical test could be tighter. I think the H1B visa variation is rich and it's random, that's nice, but it's a bit complicated. I find it uh, hard to kind of harness in a way that doesn't induce two biases. And in any case, very interesting paper. I'm looking forward to future iterations of it. Thanks. Let's move on to the second paper um, of uh, this session. So, this paper is uh, by Thomas Snow from the University of Oxford and ECGI. And the paper topic is security design for the acquisition of private firms. Uh, Thomas, please. Hello, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. All right, well, I hope you can hear me as well. Yes, we do. Nice. Okay. Yes, we do, very clearly. Well, thank you for inviting me to uh, present at this uh, wonderful M&A conference. And this paper is uh, on security design for asset acquisitions. So not uh, for um, acqui uh, acquire acquisitions. 
Uh, it's, it's with uh, another person from the University of Utah, the second one in our session, Mark Jansen, and myself and Ludo Falatou. So this paper is on a very interesting topic, one I knew absolutely nothing about, but it's essentially a huge, uh, hugely important financial security, which seems to have been uh, uh, pr pr practically unnoticed by the finance uh, profession, and that is a seller debt. And so what we're going to do is describe it very briefly, and then we're going to develop what we, what we think is a good theoretical rationale for firms using a seller debt in, uh, in, when uh, acquiring private firms or subsidiaries of public firms. So let's start out with this amazing security. Okay, what is it? It's um, issued by acquirers uh, to finance acquisitions, which is uh, probably uh, what you would uh, think. Uh, given, given, the top, given the focus of this conference, it's um, the interesting thing is it's secured only by the cash flows from the acquired asset, uh, and uh, the uh, and it is a risky security. It's issued to the seller of the asset, a non-recourse security in the form of debt. Uh, usually risky because both of because of subordination and also because it's not secured by the acquirer's other assets. This is sort of an interesting security. It's quite prevalent as well. You know, about 50% of US acquisitions of private firms are partially financed with seller debt. And it's also prevalent in acquisitions of public, of, the, of subsidiaries of public firms. And one might say, well, so what? This is just the private acquisition market. Well, the acquisition market for private firms and subs of public firms is actually larger than the public firm acquisition market. So this is a big market, a very prevalent security with very kind of interesting features. So our idea is to try to, you know, be, it's, it's logical to think, well, maybe we want to explain why firms use uh, this sort of security. So as I said, it's a dominant form of financing for private firm acquisitions. So Seller debt in private acquisitions, you might say, has a similar role to corporate debt in corporate investments. So, you know, it's the go-to um, source of, of financing or a go-to force of uh, a, a go-to source of financing. So the question, why acquirers issue seller debt, seems to us to be an important question that we are going to try to answer. Well, the first thing you might say is that, look, there are so many theories in the world. You, there's probably one you can find that will answer the question. So. Why did you come up with a theory model? Okay, there are you know, there is a huge body of research on security choice. Um, there's a bunch of security design models. Uh, there are also um, M and A models that talk about security choice. Uh, there's uh, more niche security design models, like for auctions. Uh, but as we argue more uh, more in the paper than I'm going to do right now. None of these models rationalize all the features of seller debt. The fact it's a debt claim, the fact it's risky, the fact it's secured only by the acquired assets. And of course, issued to the target because by definition it is a seller debt. Okay, so we decided to tell our own story and I'm gonna summarize the story briefly here uh, that uh, we are telling. Um, um, our story is you have an acquirer who has a slightly or more moderate or, mo or, or, or slightly or more moderately confident about the value add plan that the acquirer plans to implement than the seller. As we'll say later, he can't be too much, too over, too, too, he can't have too much excess confidence. And we have a seller that has private information about the compatibility of target assets with the value add plan. Then a distributional, a mathematical assumption, uh, but one that's satisfied by most textbook parametric distributions. And if we put those ingredients together, we get the result that the optimal form of financing to use in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, uh, in asset acquisitions is seller debt financing. So probably you don't believe me yet, so I better explain more about the paper. Okay, so more specifically, we have a model where you have an acquirer who has a value add plan, uh, but the plan will only work if he acquires assets that are compatible with the plan. So just, you know, you can think of an example is our acquirer wants to buy a small biotech that has a new COVID test. 
the, acquire, the, uh, the value add plan is to market and flog this uh, COVID test all around the world. But our small firm has private information that's very relevant to whether or not the plan will work. So in my example, our small firm knows whether the efficacy of this test is genuine or whether they've actually faked all the results. That would make the asset incompatible with the value add plan. So this is, the, this is essentially the, uh, the basic structure of the model. Uh, what do we mean by compatible? If, the, uh, the, 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 if assets are compatible, both the buyer and seller agree the acquisition will add value. The acquirer thinks it will add more value uh, than the seller thinks. So this is, kind of, this is consistent with one of the three definitions of overconfidence used in psychology, which are actually almost unrelated to each other, which is why, why using the word overconfidence is a bit ambiguous, uh, which is a domain-specific overrating of your own ability relative to others' rating. So this is, again, it is typically overconfidence is domain-specific. So boxers may feel that they're, you know, better in the ring, that, you know, more likely to win a boxing match. But if you ask, well, would, I, would you be able to do a crossword puzzle better than your rival? They might not really be sure. Um, it's also consistent with some empirical evidence on overconfidence in acquiring firm behavior, where in this paper, they did use the definition we use. Okay. Uh, if the asset's incompatible, things are extremely boring. Uh, the value is common knowledge. It's not affected by the acquisition, and it's less than the value of compatible assets, regardless of whether the asset is under uh, acquirer or seller control. So e even if the asset does not change hands, it is worth less than the value of the compatible asset if it does not change hands. Okay, offers. The structure of the, of the, the, the mechanism for acquisition we use in the baseline model is the simple first and final offer uh, to the target. And the offer is going to consist of two things, cash and a seller security. This security could be just about anything that's standard that satisfies the standard uh, security design assumptions, you know, cash, equity, convertible. And in our model, the acquirer is not cash constrained, although that doesn't make too much difference. Uh, if, if, if we made them cash constrained, they'd kind of be forced to use the security uh, and uh, we don't do that. All right, so we find that uh, the offers, you're either gonna make what's called, we call pooling or separating offer uh, pooling offers one that the acquirer is going, the target will accept regardless of whether it's compatible. And these offers will always be all cash. And uh, the, uh, such offers will always generate losses for acquirers if they acquire the asset when it's incompatible. Because they'll have to pay the compatible price to get the incompatible asset. But our acquirers, because of confidence, actually think that whenever they issue any securities to the uh, seller, they're actually, it's a losing proposition because they think the, the acquired asset is worth more. So um, if the acquirer is very confident, um, he'll prefer an all, actually prefer an all cash pooling offer. If he's extremely confident, if he thinks, you know, th things are vastly better than the, uh, than the uh, uh, target does. Uh, uh, and so uh, separating offers are different. They're a mix of cash and seller securities. Uh, and thus the offer value depends on the seller's private information. But the question is, how much does it depend on the seller's private information? And that will be determined by the security issued uh, by the acquirer. And that's the, I guess, the, one of the key points in the paper. So there's a very basic tension in our model. And uh, the root of the tension is this, because our acquirer is co more confident the cash flows to the asset conditioned on the acquirer's acquirer getting control and the and the and the and the and the, and the uh, uh, assets being compatible, uh, maximum likelihood ratio dominates the cash flows that the uh, seller expects if the acquirer takes control and the assets are compatible. Okay, um, because of seller private information, though the seller's cash flows. When the asset is compatible, his estimate of the cash flow monotone likelihood ratio dominates the seller's own estimate uh, when the assets are incompatible. So he thinks compatible assets are better than incompatible assets, but not as good as the buyer thinks they are. So um, uh, maximum likelihood ratio ordering implies that the higher the cash flow, 
the greater the probability the crash flow is drawn from the dominant distribution. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, MLR implies that the valuation difference between the acquirer and the seller grows as cash flows increase. So acquirer confidence pushes towards giving the high cash flows to the acquirer, which means giving the low cash flows to the seller, which means seller debt. So that's one tension. On the other hand, MLR implies the difference between the valuations in the compatible and incompatible state are becoming larger and larger as we move up the cash flow chain to higher cash flows. Thus, the, the more information sensitive securities are better signals of the acquirer's private information. So information asymmetry pushes in the opposite direction, away from seller debt. Right? It's not as good of a signal of the private information of the target. So the question is, how does the tension get resolved? Okay. Well, our way of looking at it is this. This is sort of an intuitive explanation because I don't have two hours to, you know, go do a, a, you know, to do, do a, 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 a university seminar presentation. But I think it captures everything. If you think of a value add plan, it can make the world a better place in two ways. It can either increase the probability of a high cash flow or it can reduce the probability of a low cash flow. Both things would make, 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 make the parties happy. These effects can vary. And uh, the effects can also vary with whether you're talking about acquirer confidence or information asymmetry. So in a very simple setting, which is a little simpler than the actual paper, I have an example which shows you exactly what we're talking about. Here's the simple setting. Suppose we just have three cash flows, zero, one, and two. Uh, what we want to do is we want to we we, uh, we 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 compare seller debt with retained equity, so we solve the model numerically for two different cash flow distributions. The first one produces optim the optimality of seller debt. The second and the second one retained equity does better. It's fairly easy, I think, to understand the forces in this framework. Okay, they're very transparent. Okay, so let's. This is the first distribution. Here are the seller and the beliefs of the seller and the acquirer across the three states. Uh, so sorry, across the three cash flows. There's two states, compatible and incompatible. Okay, so we want to compare the the upside and downside effects of both confidence and asymmetric information. So let's do that. So if we look at the downside, how would we measure the downside of you know the uh, the uh, 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 downside degree of confidence. Well, we would take the acquirer's probability for the low state and look at the, its difference with the uh, seller's probability of the low state. The acquirer's must be lower because of MLR orderings. Um, and then if we wanna measure the effect of information asymmetry, we would compare the assignment of the, of, of the probability of, of the low cash flow state by the seller when the seller has private information indicating compatibility and when the seller has private information indicating incompatibility. And so if we do that, if we look at both these differences, the difference between this uh, number and this number and this number and this number, we get a measure of the acquire confidence effect and the asymmetric information effect. And then if we divide, you know, we divide one by two, we get this ratio, which is one quarter. If we do the same exercise for the upside, that is the the increase in the probability of a high cash flow, not the decrease in the probability of a low cash flow. We get uh, we get that we uh, perform this, this, the same calculations, measuring acquirer confidence by comparing these two numbers, and measuring asymmetric information by comparing these two. Uh, we get another another ratio, and we notice that the upside effect in this example is much greater than the downside effect. The upside effect of acquirer confidence is bigger than the downside effect once you've relativized by asymmetric information. All right, so if we take another example, this is one where our result does not hold. This is where retained equity dominates. We get, this is a, a cash flow distribution. And you notice in this case, what's going on is, thank you, uh, what's going on is the acquirer basically thinks that the big effect of the acquisition is not to create high cash flows. What he's confident about is that because of the acquisition, we won't get a low cash flow. So he's, he's confident, but kind of not in the 
some, we generally think of competent people as dreamers. This fellow is not a dreamer. So if I do the same calculation here, things reverse. The downside effect of asymmetric information relative to adverse selection is actually bigger than the upside effect. So I'm going a bit fast, but I'm just summarizing what we found out. Um, what's a, the only observation that's important here is that these conditions have nothing to do with size. It doesn't matter which effect is bigger. It's all where the effect occurs, upside versus downside. It's all, it's all relativized. Okay. What, so basically, the most intuitive way to put this is in our world, the seller's information is mostly about whether the acquisition will flop, while the acquirer's information is mostly about whether the acquisition will pop. Okay, we can't quite uh, use this criteria though in our formal analysis because we have continuous distributions, but we have an analog of it that does the same thing uh, called the tail ratio condition. And we, that's our assumption four. And this basically at an intuitive level does the same thing as the upside downside ratio. When that's uh, the, the tail ratio we think is very intuitive because we kind of would, that's what we kind of think of as overconfidence. It's dreaming of the high side, not saying I'm overconfident that really bad things won't happen. Also, uh, it's the seller's information is about compatibility. So you would think it would be about low cash flows and their likelihood, not about extremely high cash flows. Okay, it's also satisfied by almost all uh, textbook distributions that, that I've uh, been able to look at. I have formal proofs for almost all of them and one I can't, but I can't find a numerical counterexample. You can generate counterexamples and we, with continuous distributions. I have one, it's kind of strange, but I have it in the appendix. So we, ha we have that in the appendix. So under those assumptions, we get the result that uh, pooling offers are always all cash and separating offers always contain a positive amount of cash and a positive amount of seller debt under our assumptions. So seller debt is sort of the, is to, is to acquisition financing what uh, corporate debt is to um, firm investments. That is, it's a, we, we provided a rationale for its uh, pervasiveness and its, uh, its, uh, its ubiquity. Uh, and I, we think in a very, a, a simple explanation you could give to an MBA. Okay, extensions. Uh, very quickly, I know I'm running out of time, uh, so this is going to be fast. Um, we basically look at, well, what happens if we change things? What if we move from acquirer confidence as defined in psychology to a more general kind of optimism? And we, we say, well, the acquirer thinks he can add value in both states, okay? Uh, but less when the assets are incompatible. What are the results? Well, if we keep that effect under control, nothing. Seller debt's still optimal. But um, eventually, as the gains in the incompatible state from acquisition get big enough, uh, seller debt simply won't work. It's not feasible anymore. At which point, we get a, we get a different sort of claim, which is um, I, which I, is better to describe with a picture since I have like one minute, I think. Uh, here, the seller basically, uh, the, the acquirer takes both a senior claim uh, and a very junior claim. That is the acquirer sort of takes senior debt and equity and the seller takes a, a, a claim which is junior to the acquirer's claim. And that, that's, a, we call it mezzanine financing. Okay, we can also change the mechanism. Some of you who love mechanism design will say, well, why didn't you do a mechanism design problem? So get rid of the first and final offer. Uh, basically, if you let acquirers to commit to offers, which they are, which if accepted will reveal that they are certain to lose money. If you think that they can commit to that, you can sometimes get a higher payoff by basically having two offers, one of which is just essentially a bribe to the guy with incompatible assets to go away. Um, well, if you, if you think that's plausible, uh, good for you. And uh, I'm, I think it might be, but it, the, thing, the important thing for us is it makes no effect on security design, which of those mechanisms you use allocation of bargaining power and that, you know, who makes the offer first. Most of these mechanism changes don't really change things in our setting because it's basically down to the cash flows. All right, I think I'm out of time, but I'd like to thank all of you for your, uh, uh, your wonderful attendance and your time and your comments. Bye. Thanks very much, Thomas, for sharing with us on this very interesting paper. Next, we are going to have the discussion for this paper. 
Off from London School of Economics and ECGI. Off, please. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to this conference and for uh, discussing this paper, which actually I, I learned a lot, both about empirics, uh, surprisingly, given that it's a theory paper, and, uh, and about the theory. And, and, and I've thought a lot about these problems. So it was uh, quite interesting to look at uh, in terms of the theory. So uh, let me see if I can get this going. So, um, so, so actually, when I started reading this paper, I was baffled by the statement in the beginning that there's so many of the of m a activity where payments are made partly with cash and partly with debt, right? Um, because I didn't actually know that. Um, there's a reason I didn't know that, because most of the data we've looked at are, you know, public m and sort of private equity things like that. It turns out when you go to the smaller universe of firms like private acquisitions, um, especially between kind of like an owner manager that has a smaller firm and wants to retire and then sells his firm on to maybe a new owner manager, it's, it's very common that payments are made in the combination of uh, cash and debt, meaning that the seller also extends some financing. And this is a graph from one of the co-authors of Tom, uh, Mark Jansen from 2020, where I looked back at and saw that this is like 50% uh, of all acquisitions, this happens. Um, so that I thought was really interesting is it's like a big set of transactions and something that I don't think people have looked at that much. So it's really an interesting thing to look at um, and test our theories on properly. Uh, so, so what is the question then based on, on this, at least to me, kind of new big facts out there that, that this paper is motivated by? So what is it that they're trying to, they think need explaining here? So what they're trying to explain is why sellers of a firm um, would accept as a package of payment cash and debt, okay? They're not trying to explain why sellers in um, M&A transactions sometimes get paid in some type of security because that happens all the time in public M&As. Like you, you have cash payments, uh, uh, sorry, cash or equity or combination of cash and equity typically in, in public uh, M&As. Um, but it's not very common with this cash and debt as a payment. So that's what they're trying to explain here, that exact combination. Um, why is that potentially challenging? Well, I think they, they're putting the bar high here in the paper because they're also saying, and I think this is kind of based on some empirical observations here, they're saying it's also not about some small, you know, entrepreneurs that are buying a new firm being financially constrained, um, because it does happen also, it's sometimes public firms buying private firms that, that use these payment methods. So it's not about financial constraints. Um, and then it's even more difficult to explain this. If, if the buyers are unconstrained, why would we think the seller should um, be financing part of this, this acquisition? Um, so that's kind of what they're trying to, to explain. And I'll get back to the financial constraints because I think there's more questions to be, to be asked there. Um, so the question is, do we need a new theory for this? I think Tom uh, was also saying, why do we need a new theory for this? And I'll, um, I'll get back to that. I don't think we really need a new theory if this is just financially constrained buyers in a market where it's very hard to issue equity because cash flows are not verifiable and it's hard to enforce things. So kind of like debt, we have many theories of why debt under costly state verification or moral hazard would be the right way to go. And if you're financially constrained, it's natural to potentially pay partly in debt to 
someone who really wants to sell and maybe knows more than banks and is more willing than banks to quickly close this. Um, so that's important. Um, do we need a new theory? Uh, Tom was talking a bit about this. We do know already from theory that when you issue sell off um, part of your firm or trying to sell your whole firm, um, and there is private information so that the seller knows more than, uh, than the market does. Um, retention of some security is kind of like a signaling device, something that uh, makes it easier to sell the firm or signal that you're a good firm. Um, that's in Leland and Pyle, in DeMarso and Duffy. I mean, it's also in some ways in Acrolef, classic lemon papers, where they talk about warranties issued to, in car sales being um, something that can help to resolve the asymmetric information problem. Now, but typically these models give you equity or something like that as retention, or they're not really looking at the security design. There is also some other models that I'm kind of pretty familiar with, or even though it's kind of niche in where it's the buyers that have private information um, and you're trying to reduce the informational rents of, of investors or buyers by designing securities. Um, if you dig deep into these papers in the appendices and stuff, you actually do find some results where this type of seller debt can occur. DeMarso, Kramer, and Scriptbars has this in one of their extensions. I would, I would, I would encourage uh, the authors to look at that um, exactly when it's the buyers that make the offers. Um, but that is actually under financial constraints. Otherwise, it would be cash payments. I actually looked back at one of my own old papers and saw that I, I think I had some of that in, under some distributional assumptions as well, but I'm even too vague about what I did in that paper to know exactly, but it may be worth checking. I'll, I'll check later and, and talk to Tom about it. Uh, but I think overall, I think if we don't think financial constraints are driving this, this is a, th there is room for a theory to explain why you would use this type of package. So, so how do they do it? Well, it's basically two main ingredients. So the sellers have some private information about the firm. They know better whether it's a bad or a good firm that they're trying to sell, that makes sense. Um, on top of that, the buyers can add more value if it's a good firm. That's kind of what a good firm means. It, it means both that you can add more value, but also that it's a good firm if the seller keeps it. So the seller has a higher kind of outside option or retention value, but the gains from trade are higher also because someone else could take this pretty good firm and make it even much better uh, by running it um, under this new ownership. Um, so you have those two ingredients. Now, what, what that gives you that you wanna retain, that it's helpful to, for a buyer to not just give a cash offer. Okay, because any cash offer that a seller of a good firm would accept um, would obviously be accepted by a seller of a bad firm as well because their outside option is worse. Um, but then you end up overpaying for that uh, transaction for a firm that where you can't really add much value anyway. Okay, so that's costly um, overpay for the worst firms if you want to pay enough to, to buy the the good firms. So the solution is to retain, to actually say, the seller keeps some stake in this firm, uh, meaning we pay maybe some cash, but also we say, you're also gonna get like either some equity or some debt um, and get paid later on as cash flows arise. Um, and of course, those securities are going to be worth more to a good, seller than a bad seller because they think the cash flows are going to be higher than bad sellers think so it's easier if you pay enough for a good firm to actually accept that package um the bad firm might accept it but they are not going to get as much as if they just got cash okay because they are not really believing in this firm so much so that that obviously gives you some reason for why you want to split this up into a cash payment and a contingent payment. But it doesn't explain why it should be debt, okay? So that's where you have to do more work. Um, so how do you explain that this payment should be in the form of debt and not 
in the form of some fraction of the equity that the seller kind of retains. So they have to work more to get this. And the way they do it is they say, well, we're also gonna assume that buyers are more optimistic about this value added. So you have basically, it's kind of like a behavioral psychological friction if you want. Um, so it's nothing about private information, it's common knowledge and they agree to disagree. We actually know there, is a few, there are a few papers that say that when you have those situations, for example, entrepreneurs that raise money to start and they're overconfident, you would naturally have debt as the right security because um, the entrepreneur values the equity proportionately higher than some outside financer who, who is more skeptical. So it's better that the entrepreneur takes the upside and the, and uh, the financier takes the, takes the debt. Um, so what they show then is that given this retained stake, you need to put in there to screen out some bad firms or at least not overpay for them under some conditions Debt turns out to be the cheapest means of payment for the buyer, okay? Now, it's not as simple as just putting these two results. We kind of know that retention is good uh, when you have information adverse selection problems and debt is good when we have overconfidence uh, because there is some, some tension here that's quite subtle, actually, that took me a while to figure out. So um, when you issue when you pay with debt, so the seller takes on debt, um, that's actually a less powerful screening device because right? it's less information <clears throat> sensitive. So you kind of have to, if you wanna make sure that you screen out some bad sellers, you kind of need to put more of the package in, in the form of debt and less cash than if you would pay with equity. So if you pay with equity, you can kind of use a smaller sliver of equity, uh, but you can pay with more cash, okay? Because equity is more uh, informationally sensitive. So there's a tension here because on the one hand, um, you want to screen, right? And you want informational sensitivity for that. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to sell the high cash flows or anything informational sensitive because of this belief difference. So that's why where all this kind of the tension occurs that it's not so easy to get debt uh, with less cash relative to equity with more cash um, as an optimal solution. And that's where kind of this assumption four, which is um, the one that Tom was talking about you need, which is kind of more unusual. Right? So it's not as simple as just monotone likely ratio property. You need some type of extra kick effect where um, the differences in beliefs grows kind of like it's sufficiently towards the top and keeps growing towards the top as cash flows get higher for debt to become uh, optimal. I don't think I'm gonna be able to show this, let's see. I tried to draw this in a graph, but no one, maybe maybe Tom would understand this if we spend enough time on it. Um, but I don't think I'm gonna go through it. It's just to say that um, it is pretty subtle. And um, in fact, equity that you would pay with relative to debt that you would pay with, they are not necessarily so informationally different in terms of the sensitivity of the package because of the cash. It's just that the equity uh, in the top, you would give them more, more away. In the very top, you would give more away to the seller. And that's costly if you have this extra assumption. Um, so that's kind of the conditions that they, they lay out for debt to be the optimal security. So let me just say what I, what I really like about this paper. First, I really like just this problem because I didn't know this, this big empirical facts. So it's a significant and underexplored phenomenon that I think deserves study. And potentially we could learn a lot by testing our theories on this, or maybe we need to develop a new theory, which is what this paper is, is doing. And as you would expect with Tom as one of the co-authors, the theory is very carefully 
executed and it's very clearly delineated what assumptions you need. They're not hiding anything. They're saying, yeah, we get the debt under these exact conditions, but we don't get it under these other conditions. And I think there's something theoretically interesting and subtle about this tension between the positive effects of information sensitivity for screening relative to the negative effects that come from this kind of, what do you want to call it? Belief sharing or uh, when you have these differences in beliefs that you don't really want to sell out the high, the high cash flows. Um, and they tease that out nicely. I think you could think of maybe doing even a more general theory paper, teasing this out in full and not being so wedded to trying to get debt as the optimal thing, because it, it, it can go either way um, and it can be an interesting thing to study maybe in, in several different contexts. Sorry, I couldn't hear Sorry, Siri is interrupting me here. Um, how am I doing on time? Well, I'll go on until you stop. So let me give you my hesitations at this stage for this paper. Um, which basically falls into two categories. This is really now an applied theory paper, okay? It it's, it's, talks about this big fact and tries to say, we can explain this. There's no good explanations for why debt plus cash is a, a dominant type of package to pay for in acquisitions. And we're gonna explain this with this theory. Um, I am um, maybe have some hesitations about whether this theory fits the empirical phenomenon and whether we actually need a new theory for this. At least I would like to see a bit more kind of empirical, careful facts to substantiate that. And the other is maybe kind of like the neatness of, of the theory, maybe have some suggestions on that. So in terms of explaining these, these small business transactions between a retiring owner manager and an incoming new owner manager. So we're talking about transactions that are less than $1 million on average of purchases for most of these firms. So th these are very small firms. Um, what I felt immediately seemed like a reasonable explanation for this is financial constraints, right? So these people who buy these these uh, private firms are often cannot afford to pay. It's kind of like when you buy a house, you need a mortgage, okay? Um, so they need financing most often. Um, it's pretty hard to get financing from banks for some of this. So it seems reasonable that maybe it would be the seller who would extend some of this financing. Why would it be in the terms of debt? Well, because I think we know that in these settings where, you know, private settings where it may be very hard to verify cash flows properly, and there's all kinds of moral hazard problems. So um, we have many theories for why debt would be the way to do it in that situation. I'm sure there is some of this retention certification also that you wanna, as a buyer, you wanna make sure that the seller believes in what they're selling. Um, but even then, I think when you have financial constraints, it, it's not hard to explain actually why you would use debt. That comes out of several of these papers. As long as you say some part of the payment has to be in, this, in, in part of the security because you, can, you, don't, you can't afford to pay all in cash. So I think it's kind of the burden of proof is on the authors to say, this is actually something that we need to explain for completely financially unconstrained buyers in situations where we believe we can contract on cash flows and issue equity in the, in the normal way. And I'm not sure that, that the empirical facts are, have yet proven to show that that would be the case, okay? Um, if you browse the iBanker web advice for private sellers and acquirers, they say this is mainly to, to help the buyer kind of like manage to finance these transactions. That's also in one of the other papers by, by Mark Jansen. Um, and also consistent with, actually the P market has sometimes used this type of vendor financing as well, but it was mostly in the financial crisis when they didn't have any access to financing that they resorted to this. 
I also have to say the whole paper, if you read it, uses as a leading example in the introduction, this transaction where um, a NASDAQ listed firm, Amri, purchases a private firm, Uticals, from uh, LCS, who was a seller, using um, partly seller debt as, as a payment package of 55 million. That turns out to be quite a bad example for the paper, because if you dig into this one, and I think that could be more generally true for these public firms, it turns out that they also paid um, 100 million to the buyers using levered equity. So it's really not a cash plus debt transaction. It's more a cash plus equity if you put these things together. So that doesn't fit the paper at all. The other thing is that this Amri, even though it's a listed company, actually was severely financially constrained. And um, so they definitely had problems financing takeovers that they did. And so much problems that they actually had to be bought out and saved later on in a, in a buyout. So it's just, and that example doesn't fit, but I think more generally, we need to look into whether there are actually a, a significant number of transactions uh, by non-financially constrained buyers um, where equity is enforceable. Otherwise, it seems like we can explain this with the, with the, theories, the theories we have. Um, so that, that's one of my, the things I really want to know more about. Also, just in terms of the theory maybe, I think maybe as a general theory, you can think more about this and do something really interesting with this tension. For this applied theory, maybe my, the aesthetics of trying to explain kind of these two phenomena, which is some of the payment is, is through retained stakes and it turns out to be debt, using two kind of orthogonal frictions uh, maybe it's not the most elegant thing in a theory paper, right? It feels a little bit like shoehorning. Like if you want to be facetious, and I don't really, I mean, you could get this criticism that a mean reader or a sloppy reader might say that, yeah, we know that stuff can, should be retained if we have information problems and sellers, uh, this other selection problem uh, at the sell side. And we know that with overconfidence, we get debt from other papers. So is it really that surprising that um, retention with some debt uh, happens when you put these two things, two things together? Um, I think the other thing is like the authors have to work really hard to get the result because of the tension that, uh, that Tom was talking about and that I also tried to talk about that actually once you have the belief difference, you need a specific interaction between salary information and value add and this assumption four with the relative overconfidence growing sufficiently with cash flows to, to get that. I mean, it's not something that falls out completely naturally. So it feels maybe slightly uh, much for, for, for an applied paper explaining this phenomenon. And I was also wondering, and this is my last thought that I haven't, I haven't solved this properly. My suggestion would be to at least check if you really need this overconfidence uh, extra ingredient in this uh, uh, to get the debt uh, and cash package. So one simplification that the paper does is they only look at two firms, one minute. Okay? Um, a good firm that you want to buy and a bad firm that you don't want to buy, okay? Um, so you always want to actually give an offer that exactly matches the reservation value or outside option of the good firm uh, and hoping and, and making sure that the bad firm doesn't take it through this sensitivity. I have a feeling that if you generalized on the dimension of having a continuum of types, meaning there are um, intermediate firms, everything from bad to good on some continuum, okay, it may be that actually you get that even without um, this overconfidence. Uh, I'm not sure, but 
the reason I think that is because if you want to give an offer, and there are many types, okay, you have to think about the marginal type that's going to accept your offer. Okay, so you would like to say only good enough types are going to affect this offer, uh, accept this offer. So we're going to make it sufficiently contingent on the performance of the firm to make sure only the sellers who believe in the firm enough are going to sell to us. Okay, so there's some middle point of set of types that you can match their reservation value. And you have to make it information sensitive enough such that the ones below don't take it. But when you have that, you also have these inframarginal types. So the better firms, right? They are actually potentially going to, uh, you're going to overpay because the information sensitivity is going to make them really happy. You pay a lot for them because they really believe in their firm. So getting like equity would, would give them a lot uh, more value. I mean, they believe in the value added you're going to do. And that's where um, debt would actually help because that's going to reduce these informational rents to, to those um, higher type firms. And that effect is not in there right now in the paper because of these two types. So that could actually give you, I think, debt without resorting to the overconfidence that actually requires quite a lot of work and difficult uh, math and tension. So that's just one suggestion to something to pursue. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much all for the uh, uh, very exciting discussion on the paper. Um, next, uh, let's open the floor for Q&A. Any questions from the audience? Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or type the question in the chat box. Any questions, please? Or feel free if Thomas would like to respond to any of the comments that Off has made. Sure, sure. Um, well, thank you for the discussion. Uh, I thought that was very uh, insightful. Um, the uh, the especially the comment about uh, the uh, what we, one could talk one could give more intuition for this result in terms of the trade off between the size of the debt claim and the size of the alternative informationally sensitive claim. That essentially, you're preferring a a, a large informationally insensitive claim to screen to a small informationally sensitive uh, claim. Uh, so that I appreciated that. Um, the, um, the problem, I guess, with uh, the, um, I, I can't answer the empirical question that these are mostly people, these are, these are mostly uh, issues of, uh, so, uh, most seller debt issues are to tiny firms uh, whose, whose owners are retiring. Um, my, I don't, you know, I need my co-authors to help me there, but, uh, but um, as far as the modeling, uh, if you could, uh, your, your intuition is probably, my, I, I would guess is right off if, if you restrict attention to uh, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, first and final offer mechanism. But if I did what you're saying, I'd get an interesting model. It, but if I worked it out in a mechanism design setting, I would probably want to have a different offer for, for each type. Because I, you know, that if I would, I would give an offer, and then the, you know, I would, I would say, announce your type, and it would be incentive compatible for each one, and then each type would have a different security, because otherwise they would be uh, copying each other, and then I would get the result that seller debt is issued with probability zero if I had a continuum of types. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, uh, it would be an interesting model, maybe a better model, but I don't think it would get me to the same endpoint. Yeah, actually, I, I, I would be happy to discuss that offline because I tried to do that thing. And I think you it may be something interesting that would come out. If, and I think you could do it because I think uh, even with that mechanism thing, I think you would hit that end point where it becomes just that. But uh, but uh, but we could discuss it offline. Yes. OK, okay. And, then, and then the, and, and, uh, and the, and the other um, uh, comment that was uh, interesting is um, I agree you have to add this extra condition 
But the reason I kind of like the model is it's, a, it's an extremely intuitive condition. I mean, it does correspond to what if, if you, when I give my MBAs and I say, you know, who's this, who's the, the overconfident fellow, the, you know, and it's usually the, they'll point to the distribution with the long right tail, not to the one with the short left tail. So it seems like a, it seems like a, agreed it's a, a combination of conditions, but uh, it seems like a ex very intuitive combination of conditions. You know, you would expect sellers to know about skeletons in their closet and buyers to be just a little bit overconfident, but we can discuss. Yeah, and I thought you you actually described that better than what is done in the paper in your presentation. So well, thank you. We're we're working on a revised version, so we need a we need some. Uh, th 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 thanks for the feedback. Perhaps we'll, we'll add this in.